Bertrand Bodson, the Chief Digital Officer at Novartis. Thanks, Babita. Good morning, everyone. Um, I didn't realize that I would get actually some dating apps and some DJs on a, on a morning. Um, Basel is something quite exotic, uh, clearly. It's good to see a few familiar faces as well in the audience from uh, probably both sides on the river and a few others. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think this is clearly a topic that matters to, to many of us. There is a reason we are here. I think Patrice brought it very nicely to life uh, as well with Emily. Uh, which we, we got the chance as well to see last year and her dad telling the story. I wanted to ask as well of why are we here? Why does this really matter? And just a few stats that are probably high level that all of us know somewhat, somehow, but that really are the cornerstone of why we are here in the first place. There have been more data created in the past two years than in the history of humanity so far. That's it's quite striking when you think about it in terms of implications about where do we store that data? How do we mine that data? How do we go and use it effectively, go and help more MLEs going forward? At the same time, as many of us know, it still takes almost 12 years to get a drug to market on average. It takes two and a half uh, billion dollars, and that's clearly way too long. So what can we do about it? I think that's the purpose of this room and the purpose of the next two days, of how can we tackle those challenges? How can we get those drugs to market much faster? I don't know if we have people as well in the audience from the Googles, the Amazon, the Microsoft of this world. I've seen quite a few uh, very interesting startups as well being present. But I think that's part of the, of the dialogue. That's part of the reason why, personally, I was uh, intrigued to join this, this industry as well at, at the beginning of this year, because I'm absolutely convinced that we'll get to see more and more of data, technology, and science starting to really converge and come together, uh, clearly for the better. At Novartis, we are aiming to become the leading medicine company powered by data and digital. That's a pretty bold statement. We've made it one of our key five key pillars to really be bold on data and digital. We're trying to act accordingly as well in terms of who we hire, how we organize our programs, how we really force the pace. And we have quite a few activities uh, along those lines across the entire areas, across how do we help patients better and, and faster, how do we improve our operations, and of course, how do we find new drugs and get them to market faster? In the intro video, uh, you could sense, and we all know, there's also a lot of hype in that space. So today, I thought I'd try to focus on a few concrete areas that we're working on within Novartis across the different areas of the business. We might argue on some of those, are those deep AI or not? Almost don't care to some extent. The point being, how are we asking the right questions? Are we focusing on things that can really drive the agenda at the right pace? So starting with our teams in research, we have, we're fortunate to have 6,000 scientists uh, across the board, uh, especially in here in Boston, uh, in Shanghai, at other places. Uh, 200 data scientists as part, of, as part of the team starting to really be embedded into the teams themselves. We're looking at uh, applying machine learning at fairly early stage in the discovery process, as you might expect, with probably 20 plus now initiatives that are really in full swing across the teams. Clearly, images is one of the uh, most promising one, one of the key areas that we're focusing on. We're spending a lot of time trying to find of how can we match compounds and disease cells, which is still a very tedious and laborious manual intensive process from our bench scientists on this. Very experimental, uh, very fraud as well to trial, very s way too slow compared to what it should be. The teams have put a lot of effort into analyzing those images, trying to use them especially around 3,000 key core compounds that we have, and to try to leverage those images to be able to train IML uh, algorithm and to try to learn about which ones could have the strongest predictive factors on untested compounds for future or other uh, cells that we want to test against. We are using a, a hell of a lot of MRI scans data to try to find new biomarkers. Uh, in Ankala, dyspolyolitis in particular, we're starting to make pretty good progress. Uh, we are looking at new stratification of patients in MS. We are looking at side effects as well that we could predict in our trials much earlier. All this is starting to, to happen at, a, at the right uh, type of pace. Now, all this doesn't come easy. We are extending this to a, a full bank of 1.5 million compounds that we have in there. 
There are plenty of practical implications to that as well. Implication in terms of storing the data in the first place. We have exponential cost in terms of video analysis that needs to be stored in a proper way, uh, trying to find solutions around this. Uh, exponential cost as well in terms of what kind of data set do we want to have. A lot of false reading as we go through that, but those are all the effective problems that the team are, are facing. Likewise, we are um, in the development side at GDD, our, our global drug development um, units. We spend five billion per year effectively on getting our drugs to market. And we have about 500 trials uh, that are going on uh, every, every at any point in time. We are sitting, which is to me an amazing stat, we are sitting on two million patient years of clinical trial data. But most of the time we take that data fairly nearly in a way that we try to get FDA or EMA approval as fast as we can and trying to use as little uh, as possible of the data or the minimum that we need to try to get to that endpoint as such. So we're trying to flip the problem and really to look at how can we mine that data much more vertically across the patch, how could we find Focusentix, one of our psoriasis drug, for example, further application, other inflammations that could be hit. How can we find new biomarkers in the data set? How can we find new patient stratifications? How can we find compound to compound combinations that could be interesting to look at all the way uh, back to the research cycle? This doesn't come easy for many reasons as well. It's like all that data is fairly disparate. Uh, the nomenclature, the taxonomy is fairly different, as you all know. We spend probably 80% of our time of mining the data and doing all the data wrangling in the first place. So that's why we want to take, we've launched a three year initiative uh, backed by the right teams with the right uh, force that we're putting behind to really go after that so that we can really speed up the process and the, and the speed at which we go, we go after that. It has other implications as well. Uh, we, I think humans tend to like not having too much data and to try to really focus and to get to the end point that we have developed versus machine love to have as much data as possible to be able to handle. So it means we have to change our protocols as well on how we run our trials. We have to change the way we try to get as much richness, molecular data, tissue data as we can, so that we can effectively go and mine that uh, in a proper way. This is another example in uh, this is uh, another example in our clinical trial operations. So, as I said, we run 500 trials uh, every single year. Um, so it's quite a massive operation as such. And the team went back to all the data that we had. It's a project we call Nerve Live all the data that we have about the trials that we have run before. We call it our science of operations. So what are the sites that historically haven't been able to hit the patient recruitment that we're hoping for? Where are the sites where we don't necessarily have the right investigator basically on the pitch at the right time? Where are we at the wrong location geographically as well to be able to, to move at the, fast, at the right pace? So a lot of the data has been, it's a lot of parameters as you can imagine, trying to start with a couple of modules that the team started uh, a couple of years ago then progressively expanding to now five, six modules. Uh, and in the early pilots, we saw some remarkable stats there. We saw 15 to 20% improvement in terms of patient recruitment that we could get on the, on the back of those. So the team got inspired then to expand that to all the trials that we have, spent some time and found their, their inspiration from other industries. So they started by spending time at airline companies, looking at how are they organized, how do they land all those planes at the same, at the same time without crushing them and really looking at those massive control tiles that were set up. And you'll see now the beginning of this, this is live effectively on, on 50 trials, where we get to see from every single step of a trials where we are at with a control tile, where the team can effectively remotely decide of where are we behind, where predictively do we need to adjust, where do we need actually to put more uh, realignment, close some centers, et cetera, et cetera. And extending that to 500 uh, sites uh, fairly soon even to the extent that now we'll have a full room dedicated to that with the control towers. I'd love to extend that to our technical operations and other areas of the business. So it's not only in research uh, and development. There are plenty of other areas where we're thinking about how do we mine the wealth of data that we have, applying AI where it's relevant. Uh, clearly, our technical operations and manufacturing is an obvious area for us. It's one of those where we have 68 plants across the world. It's still very manual with a lot of variability depending on the plants, depending on the areas. And so we're starting to think about predictive maintenance in a proper way, but for that you need sensors, you need data to flow in a proper way, you need to be well organized. Uh, we are sitting on a lot of write-offs where often stock somehow gets lost or doesn't uh, end up at the right place and doesn't get used with the right purpose, doesn't get to, to help Emily at, at the right pace. So those are areas we're looking into. 
here on the other side of, uh, of, of the country, on, in UNAG in France, we have a plant uh, over there producing Cosentix, one of the most important drugs. We have a huge variability on the yield production of, of, of this. While the data, the yield is really depending on the temperature, on the pH, on who worked on the batch, at the timing of the batch, a lot of, we have probably 200 factors that come into it. So the teams are looking at how do we mine all the data set to really get to a level where we can optimize the yield in a more consistent way and serve more patients on the back of it. So simpler applications, but effectively that are fairly easy for us uh, to, go, to go after. Many other areas that you can imagine in manufacturing. We're also looking at tendering. The Sanders team, for example, has been looking at how do we operate, apply AI to maximize our tender or to know when to effectively get into, into the space or not. We're starting to extend that now into our technical operations uh, as well. But a lot of implications about how we set up our teams. How do we get all that data organized? How do we move away from those manual processes? How do we standardize the process across our different manufacturing plants all across so that we can patch and read those data set in a proper way. Now, it's also true with our, our commercial teams. So we have the chance to have, um, we have 20,000 reps in pharma alone, 40,000 reps uh, within Novartis. And the stat that is quite striking to me is we make 100,000 visits to doctors every single day. 100,000 visits. But we hardly mind that data. So now we went, we ventured six months ago to start and looking at how can we better predict where our reps should be at the right time, at the right place, on the back of that. So a lot of it is based on early indication that we see on what have been the doctors that are most responsive at what point in time, in which type of circumstances. When do we see that a patient has had a BRF and could be more susceptible potentially uh, to a melanoma and then a pool of doctors around those uh, haven't necessarily been trained or haven't had the latest information? When do we show up on the back of that? And the way we think about it is how do we get all of our reps to operate at the same level as, as our top performing reps that naturally have that? So we went live in the US on Entresto last week, which is a big deal for us. First time that we got a rep powered by AI. We are going live actually this week in France. We're extending that to uh, six different countries over the next six weeks as such. So that's quite, quite an important one uh, for us. And effectively extending that to 10,000 to 20,000 reps over the next two years. Now, this has deep implication because it seems like, one, we needed to find the right partners as well to mine that data. We worked with a partner called uh, Actana and another one called Shift. Shift is pretty much the brain of the operations. So Shift looks at what are the rules effectively mining that data that could be interesting, that help us send our reps at the right place. And Actana helps then translate those rules into practical applications for the reps uh, then to go and, and, and leverage that, and iterating constantly about which ones are working, which ones are not working, as you might expect, and training our models basically that way. It's not just us. There are also plenty of partners, like uh, Babylon, for example, in, in the UK. Uh, we're working with, or we're looking at the ones like Ada Health, uh, which are very interesting. What those guys do is they effectively, and I guess many of you know them, they're effectively looking at a diagnosis, a self-diagnostic that you can do talking to a bot. So effectively, you'd be talking to a bot, so uh, talking about you having describing your symptoms, having look at tummy pain, and understand language that has been trained to understand uh, any form of terminology that you have as well behind, and then would ask you, okay, where uh, in your tummy specifically, for how long has it been? You enter into a dialogue, and then gets you to try to define what kind, what kind of symptoms you might have, and what the probabilities, probabilistic ranking could be of what you might be having. In most cases, the case are very standard. It's pretty much a tree uh, that gets, and then with the right training that is behind. But then when you effectively need the help of a doctor rapidly, then effectively you get access to that uh, much faster with the NHS popping in and having a pool of doctors via telemedicine and then in hospitals uh, that you can get access to. So new ways of working, new ways of thinking. Uh, if you take Babylon, they are now extending that into China with the likes of Tencent, and effectively saving eight minutes on average to each doctor, not having to ask a lot of the basic questions, being tied to the EHR fa from fairly early on, and then tapping into a pool of doctors that can access as well to patients who are in more, uh, in more remote areas as well. So quite interesting to see all what is happening and how do we play in that space as well, how do we make practical applications of this. Now, 
probably a piece that I find one of the most interesting one is we need a lot of talent to be able to go after that. And hence, that's why we are, we're delighted to be here and delighted to, to, to sponsor this event as well. But uh, I think we have incredible talent within NIBA in particular. We have our, our global statistical team is really going after that big, big time. We have recently hired uh, Raj Patil two or three months ago, who I think is in the audience and who joined us from Google and from banking, uh, having built the B2B knowledge graph at Google. Uh, we just got a new head of advanced analytic, uh, Sharam Ebadolai, who is in the audience as well today. Hopefully you get to meet him as our head of advanced analytics. He was employee number one at IBM Watson Health. Uh, we have, uh, I think, a lot of the Sanders team here as well today with Andre Haig as our new head of, uh, head of digital all basically embracing that and really raising the level of how much we want to go after that uh, across the organizations. So I think this is really a partnership for us. It's really we are looking at, uh, and that's why we are here, we are really looking at how do we tap into the best, how do we tap into the right academic centers as well, how do we hire the right talent, how do we form the right teams to really go after this. It's clearly one of our most important topics. Uh, we're clearly very eager uh, to crack the code, and at the end of the day, we are here to reimagine medicine powered by data and digital. Thank you very much. I think it's time for, for a few questions. It's me, sorry, I was having a glass of water. I can hardly <laughs> see, but yeah. <laughs> Right, um, I should have said a little earlier, Bertrand, thank you so much for that, by the way, thank you. Um, another round of applause, thank you so much for that. Um, we'd love to get your questions throughout the day through all of our speakers as well. So we have a roving microphone, so if there's anything you'd like to ask, please raise your hand and uh, we'll do a, a wee, uh, a little Q&A session. So would anybody like to ask any questions to Bertrand? Hands up, wave them proudly. Well, I, I'm going to begin by asking you one. There, there was a lot of detail uh, that you've just shared with us there. Um, for you, what's the biggest obstacle, the biggest challenge that you're facing now in terms of implementing your vision? The biggest one is, uh, I mean, there are two, I would pick two, I think. The first one is really talent, is how do we mobilize the right talent we have within the organizations to go after that? There is a lot of curiosity. And how do we mobilize in a way that we can really scale? Because a lot of it is, is quick pilots here and there, and then we're struggling to really get it to the next level. That's why as much as something like powering at 20,000 reps may not seem sexy as such, may not seem like the deepest AI as such, it is really important to us because that has an impact and it shows the ability to scale it in a proper way. All the uh, AI work that we are doing in the lab is incredibly important to us, of course, because it speeds up our ability to find new drugs and, and get drugs faster to market. But there we're struggling with the teams are spending 80% of their time sorting data out. And I think that's probably a symptom that many of us would uh, recognize, which shouldn't be the case. We shouldn't be spending 80% of connecting data sets. Uh, of we should have the right microservices, the right anonymizations, the right data wrangling ability. Uh, to be able to go after that much, much faster. It should really be 20% of the time wrangling and then 80% of uh, uh, digging into it in a proper way. But little has changed in terms of the progress for that because I remember conversations about this maybe, say, five years ago where they were saying, we're so burdened by the data collection trying to move beyond that. Why has it not transformed more quickly? I think that's why we are, we're trying to change it. I think the example that we call internally Data42 of mining that 2 million patient years of data is, is really one of those. It's really one of those where instead of, the, because you get a lot of daily pressure, it's like you're in those trials, those trials cost three, four, five hundred million effectively to run in, in a phase three. So the pressure is really on, okay, what's really the minimum we need? How do we focus? How do we get it there? So we're trying to give ourselves some breathing space to be able to mine that data in a proper way. And I think we're not the only one, like the teams at GSK has gone on that journey, many have gone on that journey. Uh, we're also looking at what's the value of what kind of richness of data set do we need to have? It changes the way you organize your protocol. It changes sure. what you want to get there. Uh, clearly, Roche, with the acquisition of Flatiron, of a foundation, is clearly an interesting kick in the butt to all of us as well, making a point that they've seen some a certain richness in real-world evidence. How do we get ready to have the right platforms to tie it back up in all of that? So I think there is a movement starting to happen. We're all finding our way. We're all starting to organize. Uh, but I see more and more evidence that we're, taking, we are, we're really going after it. On the right trajectory, then, in that respect. Um, anybody would like to ask a question? Hi, lady just here at the front. We're just going to... Oh, you've got a microphone. Wonderful. Perfectly timed. Hi. Th yeah. Hi. Thank you. That was a really brilliant talk and really nice to see what uh, Novartis is doing. 
Um, a quick question. So I'm a clinical lead in, in the NHS at NHS England. What's, what's your, um, your proposals or how are you as a big brand dealing with patients and citizens? And it's great that there's loads of back office stuff for AI, but you know, at the end of the day, these are for users, for people at the end of the day. What's your, what, wow, that was suddenly really loud. Thanks guys. <laughs> We've got you now. <laughs> what, what's your protocols there? From a patient point of view, you're meaning, right? That's yeah, but also getting them to understand what their data is being used for, that you're doing some of this in the back office. I mean, I think we all talk about patients as though they're not part of the journey, but actually it's, we've got to start thinking of the end-to-end -end journey. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think, I, I think a big part of the event really is around AI. It's framed that way with a massive question mark of, and, and partly the hype behind. A lot of, to me, the other most important thing and, and definitely worth a conference in its own right is also the patient experience altogether, which AI or not AI. It's how do we treat that? I'm coming from a space where I used to work in, in retail, uh, um, ex Amazon, where you live or die by the patient experiences that you create really end to end. And 20% and of my, my teams in my former space was incentivized on NPS, on Net Promoter Score. That's a term that we don't necessarily use a lot here. Uh, and partly it's because we don't necessarily have the same proximity for all reasons that we know of and regulatory that we have. So uh, absolutely, I believe that passionately. But when you look at the AI progress we're making on, um, on, on research, that's for patient services. It might be removed as such, but it's really for how do you accelerate finding the right drugs or the case of Emily CAR-T is, is incredible. The science behind CAR-T is absolutely fantastic. And there the patients, I can tell you, is deeply involved because it's Emily being on a bed on a very large resort, effectively taking cells out of out of her body, and then on the 22 cycles around the world trying to all of us rally to try to get that cell effectively back readjusted to be able to go and, and save her on the back of it. So she's really at the, at the very center uh, of that. If you take um, acquisition of Avexis uh, more recently for $9 billion, that's uh, for SMA, uh, for muscular atrophy. Uh, it's very, very deep where the patient sits on that because those babies, those is actually to save babies uh, typically on SMA1 who are dying in the first year. It's life or death. It's really a transformational drug that is coming on the back of it. So all the effort that goes on applying new science behind is really with the patient at the heart. Okay. If you take in the UK just the example of Babylon, I think it's quite, you, you have a uh, with partnership with the NHS at work, doesn't work. There are all sort of incentives there uh, that are that at stake of do, the, do HCPs want to play ball as well with that or not. Is, is the science at the right level yet? Is the adjustment at the right level? But that's really to help patients to try to avoid the three, four hours of triage in a hospital before being passed to a doctor on the back of that. So you're absolutely right, it's spot on. I think we should probably, ho hopefully over the next two days, that will come across quite strongly. I hope that's answered your question. I, I, I think that you're hitting on the point that many people, and I'm sure this will become a recurrent theme over the next few days, which is that end to end. How is it really making a big impact in that, and I'm sure we'll explore that in more detail. Uh, anybody got uh, any final questions here? Raise your hands, please. And don't be shy, because we're going to be doing this a few times. Uh, gentlemen, just there in the back. Uh, ladies, sorry, Mike, my apologies. I could just see a hand. Uh, we're just getting a microphone to you. If you could just let me know your name and where you are from, that'd be wonderful. Thank you, I'm Jenny with Roche, and I had a question about the role of industry and academic and other commercial collaborations in accelerating uh, digital health. I think a lot of companies, my own included, are positioned to make very large investments, but will we get far enough alone? Could you just repeat the end bit of that question? Sorry, I didn't quite catch what you said. Will individual companies get far enough on their own, yep. or what is the role of collaboration? Lovely, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a very important one. Um, I have to admit I'm struggling with that, and I hope that will come over the next two days, because there are clearly some questions where we won't be able to do it alone. There are some questions where uh, I'd love to have, in my previous space, we were big on open data, and where are areas where we can help science accelerate if we pull together basically as part of it. There are other areas with the IMI where the teams actually pulled some funding together, seven of us came together and trying to crack the code where we need standards uh, as part of it, where we cannot do it alone. My, so I'm, I'm intuitively a massive believer of us. Quite candidly, my only worry is it's already so tough to do it within one organization. It goes back to your question about, we've been talking about this for a long time, that it's a, f it's a balance as well of where are we slowing ourselves down by trying to pull too many of us and to be too nice with each other and trying to find the solution with seven of us with different strategic intent, people moving around, versus where is it absolutely necessary because we need 
uh, we need standards that needs to be across there. So I'm trying to be with the team as well to challenge ourselves of where indeed do we need much more versus where do we need to be there. And it's not just pharma companies, of course, academic centers, we partner with many. Um, uh, I mean, we're just closing on, on a few right now that will be very important to us. It's also important startups. I see partnership with the likes of Google, Amazon, etc. Uh, over time starting to form in some ways, in some shape or form. Uh, there are plenty of very interesting startups as well, like take the benevolent AI of this world of what should we be doing with them as well to really help accelerate the thinking that we have inside our, our own walls. So okay. I think that's probably where my energy would go. It's more on the, what are the most relevant partners that can help us accelerate? Lovely, thank you. I hope that's answered your question, uh, Bertrand. Thank you so much for that. You've gone live in the US, you're going live in France. This, when is this that week, next yeah. This week, and this then week. a few others following? Yep. Another four countries uh, this week. Okay, yeah. wishing okay. you the best of luck, and thank you so yeah. much for giving your time with us. Thank you very Bertrand much. Bertrand Bodson, I'll thank just you. Just one thing as well, we'll have uh, a few of us will be there at the data clinic tomorrow. I think. That's, I mean, a few of us will be on stage, et cetera, but the data clinic, I think, is really interesting because that will be run by Raj, who I think is around here. If you get the chance, or if your teams get the chance, that's really a good way to get the collaboration going about how do we clean up that data faster? How do we organize architecture to be able to go after that? So if you get the chance, it will be there tomorrow. I know 60, 70 of you already signed up for it, so. Lovely, Bertrand, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.